<laughs> you see yourself in me, but metaphorically not as part of the example. But that is a, a common thing that occurs where you see yourself in somebody, and so you um, attempt to um, kind of place your will upon them or influence, and thus you are essentially putting parts of yourself in this person. And so if there is a separation in that relationship, it feels like you've lost part of yourself. So I'm wondering why do we put ourselves in others? Okay. That's a really, really, really good question. Uh, any other questions? Claire, I mean, uh, Josephine? Um, I'd like to talk about rationality and what it, what it is exactly that makes something a rational thing to do. Okay. And also, I'd like to talk about who Anderson's, the guy with the globe in his shoulders. Right. I don't know a lot about that. Okay. Okay, so uh, the Greeks, Atlas, uh, rationality, and uh, our relationship with other people. Anyone else? Andrew? Observation without judgment or conclusion. Or, um, okay. Anyone else? I'm sorry, this, the music is on. Okay, um, anyone else? Self-worth. That's also very good. That's really good stuff. So let's talk about rationality for a moment because uh, it's easier and we'll talk about human relationships and why we invest time in other people and when the relationship breaks we feel a certain loss and then we grieve the loss. And then observation without judgment, so to speak. So let's approach this, your question about rationality historically for a moment. And it's going to be very dry, very academic. It's quite ridiculous and nonsensical, but nevertheless, uh, And of course, self-worth. You know, when Jesus died uh, on the cross and his disciples and his followers were waiting for him day after day, week after week, month after month, there came a point where they said, this guy is not coming back. And if he's not coming back, what are we going to do? And around maybe the second to third century, something strange happened. All of a sudden, people came together and they began to build churches. You know. And one of the things about the Christian message is that it's absurd. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous and absurd because it's not rational. You kill a man, he comes back to life, after three, three days. It doesn't make any sense. And you have to look at a man and say he is God. It just makes no sense. And despite all the sages around, he is the only person who will give you bread and light. He is the new Adam, but an Adam who hasn't fallen. And rationally, none of this stuff makes any sense. So time goes on and on and on and on, and it's what we usually consider dark ages, 
people just feel. You know, it's like I say something in this class and all of a sudden you're triggered and you feel. There is no rationality there. You're just a bundle of emotions. And God forbid if you're just a young punk. And all young people are just by nature, by default, they're just stupid. Not stupid because they have like mental deformity. It's stupid because they don't have the proper intellectual teeth to break things down, to understand them. It's like you're 20 and you say, my parents suck. Well, are you a parent? You know, do you know how difficult it is to pay rent? Do you know how difficult it is to take care of your kids, even at days when you're tired and exhausted? You have no idea. But yet, and none of that stuff keeps you from forming a judgment. Okay? And so first you feel, and then you pass a judgment. And your judgments, for the most part, conclusions, are, for the most part, they revolve around your own immature perspectives about things. And how old are you? 20. It's a time where you should keep your mouth shut, pay attention, listen well, but no, you don't want to do any other things. Why? Sloth is great. Being lazy is good. It makes you comfortable. So uh, since people by nature are lazy, something really interesting happened. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What's going on then? Allahu Akbar. So since people by nature are somewhat lazy and they don't want to think about things because thinking is really, really tough, uh, you have to look yourself in the mirror and realize that you actually don't worth very much despite all the things you may think about yourself. So since people oftentimes don't do that, life does something really beautiful. Life says, you know what? I'm going to create the bubonic plague around the 13th century or so. I'm going to destroy half the population of Europe. You know, and then people will be forced to say, what is God? Who is God? What is God's compassion? Why is this happening? I mean, all of us ask these questions once in a while. But to have an emotional uprising like that, where everybody begins to ask difficult questions, you know, you have a monastery, all the monks and all the nuns die because of this disease. But you have a brothel next door, all the prostitutes and the pimps, they're alive. Who explains that? The righteous die and the sinners remain alive and prosper. And then uh, people still believe, they have faith, and then Galileo comes. Says, ah, you guys believe that you're the center of the universe because God said so in Genesis. Not so at all. We are a speck of dust in the middle of nowhere. Another blow to human dignity that just because you feel some things, it doesn't mean it's true. It just means you feel something. Time passes and uh, I mean, to some extent you have someone like Charles Darwin. You know, you really actually don't need God to create life. What you have is intelligence that lives inside every living organism. You know, there is this plant in the Sahara Desert that's called a century plant. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. I mean, you look at it, it's like weed. You want to like trash it. And the moment it tastes a little water, whether it's rain or the weather is damp, good morning, all of a sudden it grows leaves and flowers and all that. For a century, it looks like it's dead, but it really isn't. It has all this life within it. And so Darwin comes about and says, there is no need for God. Life is intelligent. And life has intelligence in it. It knows what, how to survive. It gets rid of the stuff it doesn't need. And it protects the stuff that it needs. And then finds a way. Good morning. Good morning, Louis. And finds a way to nourish and you know, make them prosper, blossom. And then, of course, during all this time, something awful happens. You have all these religious wars. You know, you have the Crusades. Uh, going to Spain, destroying the mosques. You have a century be a war between France, England, and Spain. And there comes a point around 17th century. And there is this blossoming of 
new perspective. We have lived on faith alone for the past 1300 years and it doesn't do anything. You know, it's like you happen to be 30 or 40 or 50. Let's just say you're a, it doesn't matter, you're a man or a woman, but you form your relationships, all of them, revolving around feelings. You go to a coffee shop, someone looks good, you feel something, you pursue them. And then after like 20, 30 years, you look yourself in the mirror, you're old, you're wrinkly, you're ugly, you're smelly, you're lonely, depressed and sad. You say, what the hell happened to my life? And then you have this beautiful glimpse of clarity, of honesty. I followed my feelings. Let me now go behind my desk, sit at my desk and write down what qualities I'm looking for. I don't care if the guy has nice looking nose or lips or eyes or hair or this or that. I want someone who's intelligent. What does that mean? Not someone who just read some books, someone who knows how to keep a job, is good to their parents, keeps their mouth shut when it's necessary, doesn't embarrass themselves foolishly for stupid reasons, okay? And now you go out looking for dates based on rationality. Emotions consume you, you become intoxicated, you know, you can't observe, there is no clarity about you, you're just like the wind or leaf in the wind. Emotions move you around and you move according to the emotions. Okay. And so around the 18th century, which is called the age of reason, you know, faith is good, love is good. But make sure the love that you choose in your life doesn't turn into poison. And the only way you can protect yourself from that happening is make sure you understand emotions well. Make sure you understand exactly what it is you're looking for, emotionally as well as intellectually. And so at this stage, what has happened around the 18th century is before you believe in anything, it has to go through the grinder of the intellect. You know, then uh, some years pass by around the 19th century and people say, you know what? The guy has a good job. He's good to his parents. He speaks well. He has a lot of information in his tiny pathetic head. But I just don't feel anything about him. I feel like a robot. And 19th century becomes a century of existentialism. You know, the rationalists have turned life into this machine. We've all become robots. I want to feel something. You know, I want to get rid of just thinking rigorously about things. And I want to feel. I want to feel what lives inside these ideas. And then 20th century comes about. Uh, there is no faith, there is no rationality, and there is no center that holds anyone or anything together anymore. Everything is fragmented. The house divided unto itself that you find in both the Old and the New Testament, it really has a brand new meaning for us today. So when you talk about rationality, there are a couple of things that is good to know. First, we are animals that are, initially we function through emotions. That's what we do. At a certain point, you grow tired of just feeling and being pushed around by your feelings. Then you gain some maturity. And how that happens, I don't really know. I mean, there have been lots of people throughout the past, maybe 5,000 years of recorded history. They've come to educate us, but they failed. Uh, but there comes a point, there needs to come a point where you sit back and you say, okay, why am I thinking this way? This is the sort of question that Andrew was asking. What does it mean to observe? The problem with observation and the problem with rationality is that <sighs> any of you in this class, it's a question that came up in the philosophy class on Thursday where someone asked, uh, how can one find detachment? Well, before you can actually talk about detachment, you have to talk about how attachments are formed, okay? And to some extent, it goes to his question, it goes to her question. And ultimately, all these questions that you guys are asking, really, they, they have the same common denominator. They all have to do with self-knowledge. And what makes something ethical at the age of two becomes unethical at the age of 10. 
and then what's unethical at the age of 10 becomes ethical at the age of 25, and what's ethical at the age of 25 becomes unethical at the age of 45, okay? Now, <clears throat> so this is Josephine Clare, okay? Now, the thing you need to understand is you have five senses. The only thing they do is they bring in the world inside you, inside your consciousness, this bucket where you hold all of this information, okay? Now, so you have the ears, you have the eyes, uh, you have the nose, you have the taste, and you have the touch, okay? Now, the problem with these five senses is that they're always going to be in conflict. I may like the way you look, I may dislike, this is like, I may dislike your voice. So just because my sense says, oh, she looks attractive, let me hear your voice. And just in case it's high-pitched, something about me says, yuck. Now, in case your voice is, in, in case your eyes, my eyes say yes, and my ears say yes, she has a nice-looking face, nice-looking body, she, uh, what's the, she also sounds good, but she smells bad. She hasn't showered like in months. Okay, so remember these senses for the most part, they are in conflict. And somehow we have to pacify the intensity of some of the experiences that we get. Okay, I like you, I want to hang out with you, but when we go to a coffee shop, I'll be about like 10 feet away from you so I don't smell you. Okay, just in case you smell good but your body is like sandpaper, Okay, I'll say, okay, you know what? I'll go out with her, we'll do whatever, but when it comes to touching, never in a million years. Okay. So this is very, very important to understand. Okay. Now, whatever you feel, whatever you feel, to justify your feelings, to justify your feelings, let's say you don't like me. Okay. Well, that's a feeling, you don't know me. You don't know my culture. You don't know, I'm a 60-year-old guy, you're a 20-year-old punk. What the hell do you know about me? Nothing. So what do you do? You say, well, you know, I'm 20, I have all these experience, I'm going to put a 60-year-old man in the container that I have. And I'm going to judge him based on what little information I've accumulated in my life. And you call this rationality, maturity, intelligence. And the truth is, you're just a piece of shit. You have no ability to observe, to process things, and to suspend your judgment. And all because you lack the humility to sit back and say, what the hell is going on? Why do I feel this way? Is it because he or she is saying something to me that contradicts my experiences? The answer is, well, yes. We all like to put other people in a box. It makes us comfortable, okay? Now, so remember whatever your senses bring forth, they're either pleasant or unpleasant, okay? You either enjoy being around them or you don't enjoy being around them. Now, whatever it is negative, you don't want to be around. Let's say you don't like this class. Fine, drop it. Why are you here? You're not here for me, you're here because you want to graduate, because you need a grade. Okay. Hello, Phoebe. All right. Now, <clears throat> whatever is positive, you want it to be repeated. Okay. Now, both of these scenarios can create a great amount of addiction. You have a trauma in the past. Okay. You don't want to get close to people. You create this narrative. And you keep repeating it over and over and over again. Every time you get close to someone, five years later, you walk away. You don't want to get hurt, and rightly so. Okay. Positive. You smoke, you smoke again, and again, and again, and again. Because it is a liberating thing. I mean, life turns you into a scumbag. Life turns you into a slave. That's what all of us eventually become. Now... As life gives you events, that's what life does. Life creates events, events are experienced, 
experience are categorized into negative and positive. And these events ultimately create an identity. Right. And if you happen to be 20 plus, your identity, whether negative or positive, it has solidified itself within you. The only way that you can be rational about who and what you are is go to Andrew's question, which is, well, how does one step aside from who and what one has become? No one chooses. I didn't choose to be Persian. I was born in Persia, in Iran. Every morning you wake up through the speakers, the call to the prayer. My parents who are religious, my country which is immensely political and religious, all that software lives inside me. The idea that Jean-Paul Sartre has, everyone is free to do whatever, is wrong. I can only do what my software has within it, uh, been programmed. I can't go a step beyond, okay? <clears throat> Now, for those of you who want to know who you are, you are this. There is no mystery to it. You're not Christian, you're not Jesus Christ, you're not a Muslim, you're not a Buddhist. You are what you've been advertised to. And the more intensely a thing has been advertised to you, the more of that you become. It's what they call being recruited. Do you have any questions thus far before we... Sure. Why did people feel more comfortable when they put other people in a box? Like you said. <sighs> Eric from was one of the devoted students to Sigmund Freud. He wrote a book um, called Escape from Freedom. Escape from Freedom. Escape from Freedom. Imagine you and I go out for dinner and you say, so what do you want to have? Josephine, whatever. No, really, what do you want to have? Josephine, whatever. You like tacos? Yeah. Should you have some? Sure. No, but what do you want? And I'm telling you, we have infinite number of options. I don't really care. But you don't really feel comfortable with that. And you say, okay, three options. Indian food, Italian food, American food. Which one? Well, how about Ethiopian? Nah. And one of the main premises of this book, Escape from Freedom, is that, listen, I know we like to talk a lot about freedom, you know, but the truth is, it's a difficult thing. Talk about judgments. There are infinite amounts of number of perspectives out there. Why do you choose that one? You want to say Amir Sabzavari is a piece of shit, fine. That's one perspective. But you have the freedom to say the otherwise. He could not be as much as a piece of shit. He could actually be interesting. But no. It's too much freedom, too much responsibility, too much self-respect, too much maturity. So you know what? Let me box things up. He's an idiot. End of story. You've reached a conclusion. And... According to you, you've gone through rationality, observation, and it's a sound conclusion now. None of us in this class is art to be free because it's too much work. Now, this is who and what we are. Now, let's tackle your question before we go to Andrews.
I don't expect you to come to my office, Kavian. First, you never requested to come to my office. And because you never requested, I don't expect. You can surprise me by knocking on the door. There's a good chance I won't open the door. Okay. And I won't open the door and I wouldn't be interested because I'm not invested in you. Now, the way it works usually is this. This is me, I walk into class, and this is you. This is A, this is K for Kavion. Okay. There is going to be an immediate attraction on my part towards you. You have a Persian name. It comes from the Shahnameh, written by Ferdosi, the guy who reintroduced the Persian language to the Persians. And I ask you, do you speak the language? Not really. Do you read? Not really. Uh, do you listen to traditional music? Not really. So that attraction is not going to be as intense. Because though you have the Persian name, there is no Persian substance in it. Okay? Now, so the attraction is there. Now what you do is you begin to season the attraction by asking some really, really good questions. Good questions. So my attraction grows. So when I come to class and I ask, so any questions out there? I only look at a handful of people. Why? Experience. My ears and my eyes have told me there are some people in this room who ask questions every class meeting. I'm not going to look over there. I'm not going to look over there or look over there. I'm just going to look here and here and here. That's it. Okay. And as you ask more questions, also pay attention to your body language. Are you looking at me? Are you listening? Now, you may be looking at me and imagining, imagining other things. I don't know what the hell is going on inside you. But I do know that if you're doodling or playing with something, you're half there. Maybe a quarter there. Not even that, I'm being very generous, okay. Now you ask a question. And what I do, The books I have read in the past 40, 50 years, the culture in which I've lived, both Iran, India, as well as America, all of my experiences are put in my answering your question. I'm not telling you Plato. I'm giving you my interpretation of Plato. And that's the thing you need to understand. Don't tell me what Jesus said. You weren't there. These were books written by other people who never saw Jesus. You're only giving me a copy of a copy and a copy of a copy. And that is going through your interpretation. So I'm giving you me. Now just in case I see you yawning, or all of a sudden raising your hand and suddenly asking an irrelevant question, irrelevant question I feel as if part of me has been pushed away. You're not listening to me. You lack the patience. You lack the maturity. So I cut the umbilical cord. If I can see my own passion reflecting back to me through you, I have no need to look at you or talk to you. Look. First of all, For you to become interested in anything, you need to spend time with it. The more time you spend with anything, by default, you become invested in it. And by investment, it means the following. Imagine you pay $40,000 on a house payment. 
It's just not paper and money, man. It's your time. It's 20 years of your life. It's hopes and it's dreams. All of a sudden, you lose your job. Are you simply going to look at this as your money? It's your life savings. It's your self-worth. It's your identity. It's who and what you are. And now the political world plays like a, with you like a toy. And now you have an emotion called anger. Okay. So remember, you can't be invested in anything if there is no attraction. An attraction will never blossom into a bona fide narrative or history if you don't spend time with it. And remember, you only spend time with something if you're attracted to it. If I'm your brother and I'm dysfunctional, the only reason you want to spend time with me, your brother, to heal me is that you don't want to see pain and hurt on your parents' face anymore. You love me as your brother. You want to see me get better. You're invested. Okay. That makes all of us in this classroom a political animal. You will not like anyone who doesn't reflect back some parts of you. You know, Kendra and Abi are not in this class. Abi I knew from 20 some odd years ago, Kendra, who is now a professor at San Francisco, comes in once in a while. The question is why? They see part of themselves in me, and I see part of myself in them. But the question is what part? I don't like people who don't think. And I don't like people who th don't think like me. But the first part, I don't like people who think, who don't think, is that all people who think have similar teeth, emotional, intellectual teeth on the inside. All of them do, without exception. They're all rebellious in a healthy way. It's not like an 18-year-old kid who looks at their parents and says, Dad, I'm leaving. I want to go out there and explore life. You got no resources, man. You don't have the power to stand the forces of life. You'll break. Now, the more I see myself in you, what I'll do at a certain point is say, Kavya, and by the way, you know, just in case you want to come by the office and have a chat, you know, send an email. That's fine. Then you come. Then you sit. We'll have coffee. And what will happen is <clears throat> two things. I said, man, this sucked. Don't want to go back there again. Maybe it's because it was too quiet. It was too comfortable, too calm. Or you'll say, you know, this was really, really nice. I want to go back. And as you come back to the office and this class and the other classes, all of a sudden, uh, who you are becomes less. And I begin to occupy more and more space within you. There are good sides to it, negative sides to it. The negative is that you have a companion. Your companion liked you for who you are. And as you begin to change, your companion doesn't know who you are anymore. And you keep telling him, my name is Kavian, but I have a good amount of Amir inside me. Just, I, I didn't go out with Amir, I went out with Kavian. Where the hell are you? What happened to you? And then you realize you want to talk about the things we talk about in this class, your companion, but she's not there. She doesn't get it. And little by little, everything begins to fall apart. All because of investment. <clears throat> and none of us in this class have any choice but to be invested in things. That's just, you know, this is just who we are. We invest ourselves into things. We like to see our own reflection. The trick is... Finding a container that is mature and healthy, that's the tough part. You know, there is this, I don't know if the story is true, but Van Damme, you guys know who Van Damme is, Jean-Claude Van Damme? He's a poet, 